Good morning. Good to gather together today again in this way. Just to remind you, if you hadn't thought of it, that the, it is the first Sunday of the month and we will be celebrating communion together if you needed to get anything for that as um, the service goes along. We acknowledge our indebtedness to those that have gone before us in the Christian faith who have nurtured us, to those who have looked after our land and to our first peoples, and particularly in the Mornington area to the Bunurong and Burong people. And we continue to commit ourselves to the work of reconciliation with our first peoples and acknowledge our respect of their elders past, present and emerging. We were going to have a, a listen to a few verses from Hebrews chapter one. We will hear a little, some other sections of this passage during the course of our service today. But it's a passage that speaks about the nature of God. Oh, reminds us that your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is your scepter of your kingdom. In the beginning, the Lord founded the earth and the heavens are the work of his hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing, like a cloak you will roll them up. Like clothing, they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will never end. Let's pray together. We praise you, O oh God, that you are the source of life, the creator of all that is beautiful. We worship you, our unchanging God, in a world that sometimes seems out of control, we recognise that you reign over all. Open our eyes that we may see the ways in which you are at work in our world. Gracious God, we thank you for breaking through to us in the person of Jesus, your son, our Lord. When the words of the prophets went unheard and when their actions were ignored, you spoke the creative word once more by sending your son to be our saviour, to bring chaos, to bring order out of chaos once again, not in the creation of the universe, but in coming into our world and living amongst us. The essence of your love is seen so much in Jesus and we praise you for him being the pioneer of our salvation. We praise you for the lengths you went to to rescue us, to defeat the powers of evil and death, to show us the depths of your love for us. With our lives, we worship you, gracious God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. To you be all glory and honour. Lord God, we are conscious that we come to you as people who fail you. Forgive us, O oh God, for the times when we try to meet our needs solely out of our own power and resources. Forgive us for those times when we have been slow to listen to your voice in a variety of ways. Forgive us for the ways in which we have failed to be open to your image being lived out through us in the community, through our actions and our words and our attitudes. Forgive us for the times when we failed to recognise your image in the lives of other people, when we have ignored or maligned those whom you love. Oh God, embrace us in our weakness with your strength. Embrace our brokenness with your wholeness, our suffering with your healing, our fears with your peace. Cleanse, transform and renew us by the powerful work of your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We remember the suffering and death of Jesus which rescued us, which rescued us from the power of evil and sin and death in our world. We recognise Jesus as the source of our salvation. And so we rejoice in the good news that in Jesus Christ we know the forgiveness of God and we are thankful. We're going to sing a hymn together um, that focuses our attention on the greatness of God and the greatness particularly of the gift of Jesus for us. It's a hymn written by a lady who set out to write poetry as a young woman and then gave up after a while. But... At a time of illness, she turned back to this and started to write and wrote quite prolifically. 
And the book she wrote was called At the Name of Jesus and Various Other Poems. And At the Name of Jesus is the hymn we're going to sing today. Thanks, Ross. Richard has our Bible reading for us today, so we're going to hear that at this time. Good morning. The Bible reading this morning is taken from the letter of Hebrews. This was written for a group of Christians who faced with increasing opposition were in danger of abandoning Christian faith. The writer encouraged them in their faith primarily by showing that Jesus Christ is the true and final revelation of God. The first section is from chapter one, verses one to four. God through his word. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. He is the one through whom God created the universe the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe through his powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for the sins of mankind, he sat down in heaven at the right-hand side of God, the supreme power. The greatness of God's son. The son was made greater than the angels, just as the name that God gave him is greater than theirs. The second reading is from chapter two, verses five to 12. The one who leads us to salvation. God has not placed the angels as rulers over the new world to come, the world of which we speak. Instead, as it is said somewhere in the scriptures, what is man, O God, that you should think of him me a man, that you should care for him. You made him for a little while a lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honour and made him ruler over all things. It says that God made man ruler over all things. This 
clearly includes everything. We do not, however, see man ruling over all things now, but we do see Jesus, for who a little while was made lower than the angels, so to God's grace he should die for everyone. We see him now crowned with glory and honour because of the death he suffered. It was only right that God, who creates and preserves all things, should make Jesus perfect through suffering in order to bring many sons to share his glory. For Jesus is the one who leads them to salvation. He purifies people from their sins, and both he and those who are made pure all have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers. He says to God, I will tell my brothers what you have done. I will praise you in their meeting. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. St. Athanasius is credited with saying that Jesus became what we are so that we might become what he is. It's an interesting statement and it seems to sum up a lot of what Hebrews is about as a book. The beginning of this letter is quite unusual. Richard read from us right from the very start and unlike Paul's letters and even other letters in the New Testament, this one initially gives us no idea, and in fact, throughout the, the letter, it gives us no idea of precisely who the letter was written to, or indeed who wrote the letter. But before considering anything else in this letter, the author gives us a description of what Jesus is like, and quite a detailed description of what Jesus is like. The community that he's writing to, as Richard mentioned, was a community that was confused and in crisis and facing temptation. And that becomes apparent further on in the letter. And he wants them to have a sense of certainty. He wants them to know patience as they deal with the events of life and to know the peace of God in their lives. But first of all, and so predominantly, he points them to Jesus. And he highlights that Jesus is really the base and the reason for all that he is going to have to say in the rest of this letter. If they remember nothing else, that doesn't matter. If they remember to turn their eyes towards Jesus, that is enough. He's concerned about the fact that they're not really progressing in their faith and, in fact, may be regressing in their faith. But he constantly has this refrain of going back and looking at Jesus. One of the perils we have in looking at different passages of scripture, which we do regularly in our church services, is we get this little picture of a particular aspect of the nature of God or Jesus or whatever it happens to be that we're looking at. And sometimes we need that very broad, all-encompassing picture what, Jesus, what was Jesus about? What was God's purpose in sending him? How does it all hang together as a story? How does it hang together with what we read of in the Old Testament and the New Testament? And this author to the Hebrews really does a great job of trying to paint that big picture for us. He talks about Jesus existing with God even before the creation of the world and sharing in that act of creation. He talks about him coming to earth and being made at that point in time a little lower than the angels in order to carry on the work that he has here on earth. And then he talks of his existence after the resurrection when he is exalted and when he is acting as Lord of all in the heavenly realms, Lord of that bright company of heaven and crowned with glory and honour, reigning with God the Father being the heir of all things and the image of that unchanging God that we serve. And he also talks about Jesus' divinity. He talks about how that's affirmed by him being the son of God and the one who sustains all things. He talks about him bearing the image of God in every way, like the exact imprint of God in his life. 
and reflecting the glory of God through his ministry here on earth. But it's not all glorious. He also talks about the reality that Jesus shares our humanity through coming and being a part of this world. In the book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer seems to sum this up well. He says, the son of God who dwelt in the form of God, the father, lays aside that form and comes to man in the form of a slave. The divine image which had existed from all eternity with God assumes the image of fallen sinful man. There's a story told of a man in America in years gone by, a man who lost his wife and was really devastated by this experience to the extent that he moved from his hometown into the mountains and became a bit of a hermit. One day, some of those that knew him, a father and son, decided to go and visit him. It was getting close to Christmas and they thought they could invite him to join in their Christmas services at church. So they took some freshly baked goods to him and visited him. He was happy to see them and welcomed them. And they chatted and then they offered him this invitation of sharing with them at Christmas. He pointed out that he had never celebrated Christmas since the loss of his wife and that he couldn't see any good reason why God would want to come to earth as a human being. So he saw no point in worshipping with them at Christmas. But later in that same day, there was a storm that came upon that area, a really fierce storm, and a flock of swallows, of sparrows, were trying to get out of this storm, but they were caught up in the squalling wind, and they kept crashing against his windows. Feeling sorry for them, he decided to open his barn and see if he could try to get them to go in there so they'd be safe from the storm. But despite his best efforts, he couldn't get them to go. He tried to entice them with food and gestures and all manner of things, but they wouldn't respond. They were terrified and they didn't trust him. He thought to himself, if only I could become a sparrow, I could lead them in here. And then all of a sudden, the words that his wife had spoken to him some years before came to him. She had said, God came to earth as a human because there was no other way that God could tell us how much he loves us. That same sort of image of God dwelling within our humanity to reach out to us. Now, is the, as this story goes on, you might have noticed that Richard read to us part of chapter one and then part of chapter two. The lecturer leaves out the middle bit. And the middle bit has quite a bit of dialogue about how angels fit into this whole story. There was a little hint of it in what we read as well. It seems like the audience here were a bit confused about where does the work of Jesus fit in with what angels have done in the past and perhaps into the future too? So he wants to clarify that Jesus' status is always more elevated than that of angels. But when he came to earth, he chose to put that aside and to come and live as one of us. Angels are not one of those things we seem to talk about much in the life of the church today, but they do appear an amazing amount of times in Scripture. And they are one of those means through which God spoke to people. And we know, too, there are other, other occasions of God speaking to people where they say they heard a voice and they, they're not saying necessarily it was an angel, but there was this voice and this perception of a message from God that they often go on to share with others or that relates specifically to themselves. Now, to hear God speaking was seen to be reasonable and acceptable and even to some degree expected in certain circumstances in the community of that day. In the community we live in today, there'd be lots of raised eyebrows and looks of disbelief and concern probably if people talked very freely about hearing the voice of God. Some would want to refer us on to a practitioner. Yet we do see and we do affirm as Christians that God does still speak to us today. Indeed, God can speak to us through what we read and through the lives of other people. But sometimes there are those thoughts that are deeply implanted in our minds that just seem to have come to us in an amazing way and we may see as God speaking to us. And for some people, there is a perception of some sort of voice that they hear, perhaps that no one else hears, but that speaks to them. 
the Christian faith does assume unseen realities and mystery as a part of our life as a people of faith. And the concept that God carries these features into our world in coming to us in Jesus, that God communicates with us from an unseen world to the world in which we live. And in Jesus, we see that ultimate crossing of that barrier. God chooses that form of communication through Jesus, but also other forms of communicating with us. The author not only speaks about these forms of communication too as a pointer to God's relationship with us, but also of the ways in which Jesus acted and worked in our world, of what Jesus did for us. He describes Jesus as the pioneer, the one who goes before not just showing us the way, but creating a path for us. He talks of Jesus as the champion over the powers of evil and death, And as our high priest who offers a sacrifice for our sins that we may be free. Day by day, he sees Jesus as the representative of us before God, as our advocate, our intercessor, one who prays for us, one who cares for us. No doubt these affirmations were helpful to the life of that community in that time. And they can be helpful for us in our own time today too. This letter gives a really stark example of the focus that we can have as followers of Jesus. We're called to reflect the image of Jesus, this image that we've been looking at, an image that's quite amazing, but to reflect that image of Jesus in our daily living. To be conformed to the image of Christ, though, is not something we can gain by striving after it or by seeking to manufacture it. It's a work of God in and through us. But it's a work of God that God seeks to do. It's part of our purpose and our destiny as followers of Jesus. Bonhoeffer again expresses it well. He says, the image of Jesus Christ impresses itself in daily communion on the image of the disciple. No follower of Jesus can contemplate his image in cold detachment. That image has the power to transform our lives. And if we surrender ourselves utterly to him, we cannot help but bear his image ourselves. Our relationship with God, the time we spend with God, our openness to God speaking to us, can all form that perfect situation in which God can continue to transform us more into his own image. The Apostle Paul described it like this, all of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. So for us in our time, we can receive all manner of advice at various times about the issues we deal with from day to day, some of it incredibly helpful and some of it quite ridiculous at times. But whatever the issues we are that we are dealing with now or whatever issues we need to face in the future, as followers of Jesus, we have something far more than good advice. We have that opportunity to look to Jesus to open ourselves to what Jesus might say to us, to recognise that Jesus is present with us in different form now to when he was here on earth, but still present with us all the time. And that God is constantly wanting to renew God's image in each of us. This is the unique reality that we share in our relationship with Jesus. And it's the unique good news that we have to share with other people. It means that our understanding of others is also transformed because we see that the image of God is there in everyone. And when others are diminished in any way, it can prompt us to intervene and to act, to seek to restore and to seek to operate in a way which would be helpful for the other person. To recognise, as Bonhoeffer again says, that an attack on such a person is really an attack on Christ who took the form of a man in his own person and restored the image of God 
in all that bear a human form. Amen. We were going to share in a hymn today that we may not have heard before or shared in before, but it's a hymn that, again, like our Bible passage, gives us a whole manner of different phrases and images of what Jesus is like and of our worship of him, of our desire to be open to him and to allow his image to be imprinted on our lives. It's a hymn called Beloved and Blessed and uh, feel free to join in as you feel comfortable with it or just to share in listening to it together. Thanks, Ross. We come now to, to our time of sharing um, notices and joys and concerns at this time. Um, I was reminded of the, the fact that Beryl Sheriff is having some surgery during the course of this week on Wednesday and would um, appreciate our prayers at this time. And we continue to pray for others recovering from surgery and others with other needs in the life of our congregation. Do other people have things they particularly wanted to share with us today? It's like Nancy might, yeah. I just want to draw people's attention to the report in the pew sheet about our Uniting Church at our fellowship meeting on Monday. Uh, thanks to Ross and Helen and Lorraine, it was a, a really, really, really successful get together. And uh, the interesting talk from Anne Connan, um, as it says in the report, she was able to draw us all in by the way she presented her talk and uh, and also really enlightened us as to how UCAF is linked to fellowships around the world and linked as a, um, a non-government organisation with United Nations. I don't think any of us really appreciated that. So it was a really um, great time of, uh, of getting together. And hopefully, since it all went so well, we'll do it again uh, in October. Thanks, Nancy. 
by way of notices to um, just to remind those some of us joined together to um, share in a, a study group during the day this week on Wednesday. There isn't a group this week. I have some commitments with college on those days this week. Um, but that group also decided that they would like to look at a, a book, um, a booklet that Annika Oppenwell has produced. It's this little book here called, and it's based on the, the story of Job. It's really six sermons she preached um, in the one of the previous times when Job came up in the lectionary. It's in the lectionary at the moment for the next few weeks. But she preached it and then used it in her own congregation as a study guide. So it has some discussion questions. I did mention in the newsletter that we're using that for that purpose. But if other people were interested in, would like a copy of this, if you let me know, I can um, order some from her. She printed lots of them, I gather, and this still has quite a few that she's able to give to us. They're costing $10 if anyone was interested. That was also in the newsletter, I believe. Dick. Just to report, uh, I've been talking to Jack Carter this week and he's doing very well and uh, sounds very bright. Had his 80th birthday on Thursday, I think it was. And uh, so, and was able to have visitors, visitors looking in his window to him anyway, uh, but without actually going into the uh, centre. But uh, he's doing very well, doing his exercises and says he's feeling much stronger than he had before. That might be all of the things that we have to share, I suspect. And Anne was going to lead us in our prayers during this time. Lord, we come before you in prayer. Father, we bring before you the world, the turmoil, the tension. We pray for our leaders that they may be conscious of what's right for our people. We pray for the conflicts between nations that you may help us to intercede with them. Lord, we pray for our nation as we see our leaders struggling to overcome a pandemic and the conflicts and the political things that happen. Lord, we pray for our community. Hear our prayer and hear that we as a people can contribute to our community. Lord, we pray for uh, the people who are sick that they may feel healing. For those who are mourning, that they may have comfort. We pray for injustice in our community that we might step up and be a voice against that injustice. We pray in silence for those that we know in our community that need your, your love and your support. Lord, be with us in this time of isolation that we may reach out to others and be still a part of the community. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. And we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Um, we might just pick up the Lord's Prayer. Oh, sorry, I forgot that we're having communion. Sorry. Yeah. It's, I've done that myself many times. Thank you very much. But we are going to continue in a, a prayerful state anyhow as we um, continue to focus our attention on God's generosity towards us and on the gifts that have been given to the life of God's work in this place and beyond through this congregation over this time. We'd like to dedicate those gifts to God that have been given. So let's pray. Gracious God, we ask you to receive and bless the gifts that have been given and those that have been set aside for your work in this place and beyond this place. We offer them to you in response to your great love for us and for the great gift of Jesus Christ for us as our Saviour and our Lord. May our lives, O oh God, reflect your glory. May they bear the imprint of your image upon them. May they show your love to those around about us as we reach out in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are coming to our time of sharing together in communion, and we're going to use a communion hymn which also speaks about um, focusing on God and, and seeing God in the midst of all of our life. Here, gracious Lord, we see you face to face. So in these unusual times, we gather together and we recognise that as we gather, we carry the presence of Christ with us wherever we happen to be. We continue to share in the inheritance of the hope that we share in Jesus Christ. We recognise at this time that some may choose not to partake in communion whilst we are dispersed as we are and others may. And we recognise that we are together held in the arms of Christ and that those choices are fine. As we meet together, we recognise too that we see this as an open table, that all are welcome to take part and to share in this. 
we acknowledge that at this time, this can be an unusual way of celebrating this act that we normally have in the life of our church community. And yet it is also an act that draws us together and affirms the fact that we remain the community of Christ, whether we are together or separate. Let's hear some words from the Apostle Paul speaking of Jesus and Jesus giving us this process. Among friends gathered round a table, Jesus took bread and having blessed it, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. In the same way, he took wine and having given thanks for it, he poured it out and gave the cup to his disciples saying, this cup is the new relationship with God sealed with my blood. Take this and share it. I shall drink wine with you next in the coming kingdom of God. So now following Jesus' example, we take this bread and this wine, the ordinary things of this world through which God will bless us. And as Jesus offered thanks for the gifts of the earth, let us also celebrate God's goodness together. We come to the great prayer of thanksgiving for which we have some common responses which you probably know even without words. The Lord be with you. Oops. Oh, thank you, Ross. I missed that. <laughs> the peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy and glorious God, we give you thanks and praise that you reign over all things and that nothing takes you by surprise. That even in the midst of this pandemic, we can know the reality of your presence with us. Almighty God, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. Guide us by your light. Holy God, we give you thanks for revealing your power in the creation of the universe, for your faithful provision for all of creation, and particularly for creating humanity in your own image. Thank you for guiding your people over the ages, for constantly honouring your covenant of unfailing love and grace, for speaking through the prophets, for rescuing your erring people. We praise you, O oh God, for revealing yourself to us in the humanity of Jesus Christ and for the life we know in Jesus Christ, your son. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Leading his followers, he guides us. Dying on the cross, he rescues us, and risen from the dead, he gives us new life. We offer you praise, gracious God, for in the communion of your love, Christ comes close to us and we come close to Christ. Therefore, with all our sisters and brothers, we praise you from our hearts for your unending blessing in the eternal hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, do in this room, in these places, what you did in an upstairs room. Breathe your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us heaven's food and drink, renewing, sustaining, and making us whole, and that we may be your body on earth, loving and caring in the world. We bless your name, O God, and gather our thanksgivings together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The bread that we break is the sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup that we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Together with the elements that you share in at home, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. We have some other responses to the Agnes Day. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. We take some bread and we remember as we do this that the body of Christ is broken for each of us. And we take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for us. Amen. And we, we take some juice or some wine. And as we remember and take this, we remember that the blood of Christ was poured out for each of us. We take and drink this in remembrance that Christ died for us, that we may have eternal life. Amen. So as we come to the end of our time in sharing together, we're going to share a prayer together as we conclude this celebration of communion. You have come close to us and we have come close to you, Lord Christ, in this sacred meal. Help us to renew our commitment to you and to allow you to empower us for service so that we may give ourselves to share the wonder of our relationship with you and to care for creation and the suffering ones of the world. Thank you, God, for our calling. May we remain open to the blessing of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now we're going to just share a couple of verses from a, a hymn that commissions us in our going out into the world, having shared this meal together. Now let us from this table rise. So as we go into this week, may we go with the love of God inscribed upon our hearts, with the life of Jesus implanted deeply within our beings and the energy of the Holy Spirit energising us and giving us life. 
And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with us all now and evermore. Amen. Amen.